When the Dungeons and Dragons animated series ended in the fall of 1986, the storyline had been left unresolved. However, series writer Michael Reeves had been commissioned to write a script which provided a resolution to the story. Unfortunately, that script was never storyboarded, never produced, that is, until now. In response to millions of requests from Dungeons and Dragons fans, BCI Eclipse is proud to present the original Michael Reeves script performed in a radio show format featuring voice actress Katie Lee recreating her original role of Sheila. Close your eyes. Transport yourself back into the realm with Hank, Diana, Eric, Sheila, Presto, Bobby, Uni, and the evil Venger as we present the final chapter in the Dungeons and Dragons story, Requiem. The plane of dreams is stark, surreal, brooding. The gray fog that's all about is eerily luminous. We cannot tell if it is day or night. In the midst of the desolation, Dungeon Master steps forward. Venger? Just then, a magic bolt splits a monolith, and Venger emerges from the swirling fog. Dungeon Master, you are a fool. Your pupils are doomed to failure. They are brave only because they know you stand behind them. Not so. They can triumph over anything in the realm, as you well know. They will not fail. Well then, perhaps you would not be adverse to a test of their courage. We shall see how brave they are when you turn away from them. If they succeed, they will find the key. And if they fail? What do they lose? Everything. Their weapons. And their lives. So be it. Meanwhile, on the moors, all seven heads of an enormous hydra lash out. As Bobby, Hank, Eric, Diana, Sheila, Uni, and Presto all run for their lives across a swamp. The hydra's in hot pursuit. Again! Just then, Hank stops and fires an energy arrow at the Hydra. The arrow wraps itself around the Hydra's necks, pinning them together for an instant. But the Hydra breaks the glowing bonds and keeps coming. It's too strong! One of the Hydra's heads swoops down, grabs Eric by the cape, and lifts him up. Help! Thinking quickly, Bobby swings his club at a dead tree, knocking it loose from its roots. The tree begins to topple. The tree falls close to the Hydra. As the Hydra dodges it, he inadvertently releases Eric. Eric falls to the muddy ground below. He rolls out of the way of a strike from one of the Hydra's other heads, just in time. That thing's got more heads than Tiamat! During the melee, Diana dodges one of the Hydra's heads and leaps over another, a true acrobat. There's no place to hide! It's gonna get us sooner or later! Two of the Hydra's heads has Presto, Sheila, and Uni trapped against a small spur of rock. Presto has no room to use his hat. It's God's corner! Hang on, sis! I'm coming! But just as Bobby raises his club over his head to strike, one of the Hydra's heads swoops down and seizes his club, lifting him from the ground. Bobby dangles helplessly, holding onto the club for dear life. Whoa! Eric scrambles across the marshy ground on his hands and knees, crawling for his life. He grins in sudden relief. All right, everything's going to be okay now. Hank and Diana back up warily as the Hydra's heads continue snapping at them dangerously close. Their weapons are ready. Just then, they look up and smile with relief. Dungeon Master! It's true. Dungeon Master is there, looking down upon the kids as they continue battling the creature with a grim expression. Dungeon Master, help! Come on, Dungeon Master, help! Dungeon Master, help! You got into this by 
by yourselves, my young friends. Now get out of it by yourselves. He turns his back and steps down off the rock. Disappearing from view, Eric shakes his head in disbelief. Huh? But one of the Hydra's seven heads is aiming straight for Eric. Just then, Hank dives in, pushing Eric out of the way of the snapping maw. I don't believe it! He deserted us! We'll worry about that later. If there is a later... Hank fires three energy arrows, still trapped by the Hydra's heads. Presto, Sheila, and Uni fear for their lives. But one of Hank's arrows strikes the rock wall beside them and splits it in two, allowing them to escape through the middle of it. <laughs> Still dangling from one of the Hydra's beaks, the second arrow strikes the club and knocks it free of the beak's grasp. Bobby lands safely and runs to freedom. The third arrow explodes before the Hydra's eyes, causing it to jerk back, which allows Diana to leap over a rock and escape. As they regroup, weapons at the ready, Uni cowers against Bobby. Kids run through the marsh, tripping on roots and patches of mud, splashing through odorous, noxious pools, getting their clothes caught on bushes. Their faces are full of fear. The Hydra is right on their heels as they run for their lives. <laughs> Hank leads the group towards a nasty, slimy green bog. Get ready! The kids reach the very edge of the bubbling bog. Now! Scatter! The kids break off to either side, running along the edge of the bog. The momentum achieved by the large, clumsy hydra cannot be stopped. It blunders into the middle of the bog with a tremendous splash. Mud and slime flies everywhere. The hydra flounders helplessly as it slowly sinks into the murky depths of the bog. <laughs> out of the Hydra's reach, the kids regroup at the edge of the bog, tired, mud-spattered, exhausted. We did it! We're still alive! Yeah, no thanks to Dungeon Master. At a crossroads in the salt flats, the two suns are low in the sky, turning the flats into a brilliant crimson. The kids find themselves at a fork in the road, though neither road looks appealing. The east fork appears to be better traveled. Presto reads a sign made of weathered gray wood that's pointing upward, hanging on a single rusty nail. According to this, the flame mounds are that way. Bobby picks up a second sign which has fallen to the ground. This way to the Sea of Sorrow. Great. Which road leads where? Who cares? It doesn't matter. I, I can't believe he would just abandon us like that. Eric starts down the Eastern Fork, but Hank carefully examines one road and then the other. We go west, Eric. Why? It's downhill. We're more likely to find water. The other way's a better road. Might lead to a town. I'm the leader, Eric. You said so before, remember? But Eric steps up to confront Hank face to face, locking gazes. I was under a lot of pressure then. Maybe I see things clearer now. Maybe it's time we had a little election. What do you say, Presto? Uh, well, the eastern road does look better. Yeah? Well, I think the west road looks better. Now, wait a minute, Bob. Keep out of this, sis. You're always How come you're always right and I'm always wrong? Hold it! Hold it! Come on. We all know what this is really about. We're not mad at each other. We're mad at Dungeon Master. I don't know what to tell you, except that it's getting dark. We'd better find a place to camp. You want the point, Eric? You got it. Lead the way. Looking resentfully at Hank, Eric turns and takes the Eastern Fork. The others follow. Hank is the last one to go and brings up the rear. Later at the Sea of Sorrows, a pile of driftwood is ignited by one of Hank's energy arrows, turning it into the flames of a campfire. The kids gather around the fire as the reflection of the moons shimmer on the surface of the sea. Maybe it wasn't really Dungeon Master. It was him. Do you think I wouldn't know him? This whole realm is a dungeon, you know that? And we're all prisoners. 
We thought Dungeon Master was our friend, but it turns out he's just another guard. What are we going to do now? If Dungeon Master's abandoned us, who's going to help us? I will help you. Recognizing the voice, the kids leap to their feet in an instant, weapons ready. They stare into the darkness that surrounds the fire. Venger steps out of the darkness into the flickering firelight. He holds out his hands in a gesture of peace. Be at ease, my young enemies. I shall not harm you. Move very slowly, Venger. So Dungeon Master has finally shown his true colors. Have you never wondered why his advice always led you into battle and never back to your world? It has been convenient for you to see Dungeon Master as good and me as evil. But things are not that simple. I have granted you your lives before. Aid me now, and I shall grant you your dearest wish. I will send you back to your own world. As Venger gestures toward the campfire, the flames blaze up, forming a miniature portal in which the amusement park appears. The kids stare longingly at it. Far to the south lies Realm's Edge. There you will find a cenotaph, an empty tomb. Within it is a key, which you must cast into the abyss. Do this, and you will go home. You have my word. The flames blaze up again higher than ever. When they die down, Venger has vanished. Hank fires an energy arrow into the sky in a gesture of defiance. It explodes above them like a flare, casting an eerie light. Forget it, Venger! No way we're working for you! Wait a minute, Hank. What choice do we have? Dungeon Master's abandoned us. Venger, he may be our only ticket home. I think Eric's got a point, Hank. Venger's ruthless, but he's got a code. I believe him. So do I. All I want is to go home. And I don't care who's responsible for sending us there. You guys can't be serious. You know Vendor's bad news. Eric, we gotta stick together. Why, Hank? We always stick together and it hasn't gotten us home. You guys can go do what you want, but we are going after that key. Eric turns and leaves the campsite. Presto hesitates for a second, then follows him. Bobby? Won't you change your mind? I think you're making a mistake, Sheila. Sheila turns and runs into the darkness after the others. Hank, Bobby, Diana, and Uni watch her go. Later, further down the seashore, an ancient galleon is wrecked there. Sails hanging in tatters, salt stains glittering in the moonlight. Eric, Presto, and Sheila climb onto its deck. You think he can make this thing fly, Presto? Presto takes off his hat and makes magic pass over it, frowning in utmost concentration. Magic in the hat be free, let us use the sky as the sea. A shimmering arc of magic light erupts from the hat, engulfing the galleon and lifting it, freeing it from the sand that had held it prisoner for possible centuries. The ship rises, the remnants of the sails flap uselessly. Are we doing the right thing, Eric? I don't know, but we're not turning back. Back at the campsite, Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni watch the silhouetted ship sail across the three moons. We've got to get to Realm's Edge first. Somehow. Just then, a huge bronze dragon lands at the water's edge, its wings spraying foam and sand. Bobby raises his club. Just what we need! More problems! Wait, Bobby! That's a bronze dragon! It might help us! The bronze dragon carefully watches Diana as she steps forward, her staff raised. She taps it gently on the horns with her staff. With a snort, the dragon lowers its head. While the unsure Uni huddles between two of the dragon's huge dorsal plates, Diana sits behind the horns of the enormous beast. I hope you know what you're doing, Diana. So do I. And with another tap on the dragon's horns, the wings of the great creature lift them all into the night sky. The bronze dragon flies after the shrinking form of the galleon. Later, in the west, the two suns are rising. Diana, Bobby, and Uni are asleep, curled up in the hollows between the plates on the bronze dragon's back. But Hank is still awake, standing alertly, still watching the galleon, which is miles ahead. 
Diana awakens. You should get some sleep. Why do you think we're here, Diana? In the realm? I always thought it was to defeat Venger. Yeah, so did I. But I'm beginning to wonder. Maybe Venger's right about one thing. Maybe things aren't that simple. Hey, look! Bobby stands atop one of the bronze dragon's plates and points ahead as they approach a range of mountains, which consist of active volcanoes. Curtains of smoke and ash hang over bubbling cauldrons of lava. Incandescent fountains shoot up. None of the peaks are in the throes of a major eruption, but altogether, they present a dangerous gauntlet to run. The galleon weaves its way through the deadly peaks. Eric looks over the side and gulps as they pass very close to a lake of fire. Hey, we're slowing down, Presto! Presto removes his hat and shakes it furiously, trying to dump more magic out of it. I think my spell's running out of gas! They're gaining on us! The bronze dragon quickly approaches the flying galleon. Stop, you guys! Please! No way! This is our last chance to go home! Have it your way! Hank pulls back an energy arrow, but Diana grabs his arm. Hank, what are you doing? I'm going to force them down. Hank fires his arrow, but Eric raises his shield, and the arrow ricochets off it harmlessly. But the arrow plunges straight down into the seething molten rock, setting off a tremendous eruption. A rain of fiery fragments showers down on the deck of the galleon, setting the bits of sailcloth aflame. Glowing clouds surround the ship. Sheila and Presto crowd under Eric's shield as chunks of brimstone bounce off it. <laughs> Red hot boulders are hurled from the volcano's crater. The entire side of a neighboring peak blows out, sending out a deadly cloud of incandescent gas and powdered stone directly toward Bobby, Hank, Diana, and Uni. As the bronze dragon deftly attempts to avoid the cloud, it continues toward them like a rolling black wave. It's too fast for us! Diana grabs her staff and gently taps the dragon under the jaw. Go up! The bronze dragon swoops up, higher, higher. The boiling crest of vaporized rock just barely misses it. As the flame mountains in the distance paint the sky a baleful red, rivers of lava glow along the horizon. The exhausted bronze dragon lands at last. Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni disembark and bid the bronze dragon farewell as it flies off. They didn't make it, did they? Sure they did. They've come through tougher spots than this. Hank? I'm sorry, Bobby. It was my fault. What do we do now, Hank? The volcanoes won't let us go back. We'll have to go on. To Realm's Edge. They look off and see the plains which rise for a considerable distance, then ends at the edge of a cliff which stretches in either direction as far as they can see. At the edge, barely visible, is the Cenotaph, a lonely crumbling tower on the edge of the world. But in another part of the plain, Eric, Sheila, and Presto are picking their way over the cracked black lava plain. The wrecked and smoldering galleon is behind them. Sheila scrambles to the top of a large slab and looks from side to side. Bobby? Bobby! Any sign of them? Nothing. They must have been... It's not your fault, Eric. Oh, yeah, right. Somebody else used my shield to bounce a flame arrow into a volcano. If you hadn't gotten your magic hat to bail us out, our gooses would be charcoal now. Come on. The least I can do is find Venger's key and get you two home. At Realm's Edge, the Cenotaph rises skyscraper high on the edge of a cliff. Two figures are barely visible atop it, Venger and Dungeon Master. You will lose, old man. Their desire to return to their home is stronger than anything else. Without your support, they will crumble. Their courage will not fail them. They will do what has to be done. From atop the Cenotaph, Venger and Dungeon Master watch the two groups of kids make their way slowly to the tower from opposite sides. The rough terrain hides each group from the other. We shall see. That which is in the Cenotaph will test their courage. At the entrance of the Cenotaph is a huge door in the shape of a dragon's head. The open jaws framing the entrance. Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni stand before it. We're here. Now what do we do? I don't know, Diana. I think we've gone as far as we can go. 
I guess I've led us straight to disaster. But just then... Hey, look at the bright side. You beat us here. Eric! Bobby! Boy, am I glad to see you. Oh, I'm, I'm so, so glad, glad, glad to see you. Oh, it's oh, look at you. I thought you were grinners. Wow, I haven't aged at all. Out of that? I'm sure glad you guys are okay. Now all we have to do is get the key and we can go home. You're not still planning on that, are you? You bet we are. I want to sleep in my own bed tonight. Eric, you're already sleeping and dreaming if you think Bender's going to follow through on his promise. If there's even the slightest chance... Forget it, Eric. Nobody opens this door. That's what you think. Presto, show him. Well, okay. Presto takes off his hat and aims it at the door. A bolt of magic force erupts from the hat, surprising even Presto himself. The force of one of the bolts batters through the Cenotaph's door, splintering it into a million wooden shards. Another bolt has trapped Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni in its coils. That's three, Presto! You're on a roll! By the time Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni have freed themselves from the magic bolt, the others have fled from sight. We've got to stop them! They're playing right into Avengers' hands! They run into the Cenotaph after their friends. Meanwhile, Eric, Presto, and Sheila have already entered a huge empty chamber as they start up the adjoining stairwell. An energy arrow bursts in the air ahead of them, bringing them to a halt. The three look back and see that Hank has another arrow drawn. Don't do it, Eric! How are you going to stop me, Hank? I don't know, but neither of us want to find out. Suddenly the tension is broken as the floor shakes with a deep rumbling. <gasps> what was that? The rumbling continues as the floor cracks beneath them. Through the cracks flow viscous, jelly-like streams of translucent protoplasm. The streams head directly for the kids. Get off the floor! Quick! As the kids head for the stairwell, the goo takes the form of a huge amoeba-like creature. It surges after them, almost flowing over Uni's front hooves. She dances back wildly to avoid it. What is it? Whatever it is, it knows what we are. Lunch! Yeah? Let's see if it likes its food spicy. Hank fires an energy arrow into the creature, but it absorbs it, unharmed, and continues to surge forward once again. Looks like it liked that just fine. Let me try. Presto's hand pulls out a glowing sphere of magic, which he hurls at the amoeba. But the creature absorbs the magic ball with delight and continues to surge toward the group. Where's Steve McQueen when you need him? We'd better think of something. This bowl of jelly means business. Yeah, well, so do I. Bobby runs toward the gelatinous creature, his club raised determinedly over his head. Sheila grabs for him but misses. Bobby, be careful! The huge amoeba rises above Bobby threateningly, but Bobby smashes his club against one wall of the stairwell, then the opposite wall. The walls crack and crumble and bury the amoeba beneath tons of debris. The gang retreats from the dust and flying fragments of rock and mortar. Bobby, are you all right? Good news and bad news. That thing's been buried. And the bad news. But we can't get back down. In the battle, the stairwell has become completely blocked. Eric looks at Hank in satisfaction. Which means we have to go up. You win. For now. The kids begin their climb up the stairs. In the topmost part of the cenotaph is the sanctum, a huge cathedral-like chamber with a gigantic vault on one wall. The wall opposite the vault has collapsed, revealing the abyss beyond the realm. In the middle of the floor sits an ornate sarcophagus. The lid is carved in the shape of a figure lying in repose. Venger and Dungeon Master stand beside it. They are coming, Venger. Doubtful and suspicious of each other and their quest. But still coming. Ha! They can yet fail, and they will. Do not celebrate your victory yet, old one. It is not I who will be the winner, Venger. It is you. They are here. The kids, led by Eric, enter the sanctum. Venger and Dungeon Master have vanished. So this is it? Doesn't look like much. Diana points toward the broken wall and the abyss that lies beyond. The group approaches with caution and looks out over the ultimate gulf. Look! It goes on forever! What they see is an endless cliff dropping into the mists of night, thousands of miles below. 
Stars twinkle in the depths. Barely visible are several continent-sized pillars that support the realm itself. Sheila moves away from the awesome sight and approaches the vault. Amidst all its ornate majesty is a keyhole. There's a keyhole here. This is a door. Presto steps up to the sarcophagus and looks at the face of the figure carved on its lid. Look, over the lid, it's... The figure is that of a man in warrior's garb, arms crossed on his chest. His face, though noble and serene, is lacking the fangs, horns, wings, and other accoutrements of evil. It is unquestionably that of... Avenger! I don't get it. Who'd want to make old Hornhead look good? Only one way to find out. Open. The kids all line up on one side of the sarcophagus and push at the heavy stone lid. The lid moves slowly to one side, revealing the interior. It is empty, save for one thing. An ordinary brass key lying at the bottom. Eric reaches in and grabs it. We've got the key. Now all we've got to do is throw it in the abyss and we're home free! Don't you get it yet? We'll never get home by trusting Venger. Out of my way, Hank. No, I'm right about this. I know it. As the two raise their weapons in an apparent face-off, the kids are suddenly thrown off their feet by the shattering of the floor next to the sarcophagus. Again, the giant amoeba rises from the floor. Its tentacles lash out in all directions. The kids scatter to avoid them. Watch out! Oh, oh, no! Still holding the key, Eric is hit by one of the tentacles and knocked to the floor. When he lands, he ends up near the edge of the abyss. He looks at the key, then into the abyss, then raises his hand to throw it in. But Eric's hand is stopped by Hanks. No! Let me go! Meanwhile, Diana has raised her staff in defense against the lashing tentacles of the giant amoeba. But one of the tentacles wraps itself around Diana's staff and pulls her toward it. Presto holds his hat before him, causing it to glow. But before any magic can emerge, one of the amoeba's tentacles wraps around the hat, closing it and seizing Presto's arms. Presto is lifted off his feet. He dangles helplessly in the amoeba's grasp. Hey! Both Hank and Eric are on their feet now, continuing their struggle, both holding on to the key. Hank's back is to the abyss. Let me do it! You want to be a prisoner here forever? Eric, remember what you said about this whole realm being a dungeon? I think you were right. We're all prisoners here, including Venger. And this is the key. Elsewhere in the sanctum, Uni is backed up into a corner. A tentacle wraps around her and lifts her up. <laughs> Sheila flips her hood up over her head as another tentacle reaches for her. She becomes invisible, but the amoeba apparently uses senses other than sight to track its prey. A tentacle wraps around Sheila's invisible form. Her cloak falls away and makes her visible again. She is lifted, kicking and screaming off the floor. Bobby, backed into another corner, is swinging his club to keep the amoeba at bay. He sees his comrades in trouble. Sheila! Uni! He raises the club over his head and slams it down on the floor, sending shockwave ripples through the stunned amoeba, causing it to drop Sheila, Uni, Diana, and Presto. <laughs> But while the shockwave from Bobby's club has freed the four, it has a more negative impact on Hank. The vibrations have caused Hank to let go of the key. Hank drops his bow, staggers unevenly backward toward the edge of the abyss. He tries to regain his balance, but it's no use. He falls backwards into infinity. Ah! Eric lunges for him. He's gone. The amoeba has now recovered from the effects of Bobby's blow. It flows toward the group like a gelatinous wave, surrounding them on every side. The kids try to free themselves, but it's no use. Another moment, and it will encase them all completely. <coughs> Eric looks toward his doomed friends, then at the abyss, then at the simple brass key he holds in his hand. Suddenly, Venger materializes before him. The key, Cavalier. Throw it into the abyss, or you will never see your home again. 
Weighing his options, Eric looks into the abyss, then in the opposite direction. Eric eyes the keyhole on the vault. And in a last second snap decision, he lunges toward it. Venger spreads his wings in angry wrath. Stop! Venger hurls a magic bolt at Eric, which blasts against his shield. It staggers Eric for a moment, but he keeps going. As Venger raises his hand to hurl another bolt, a tentacle from the amoeba rises up, wraps itself around Venger's arms, and pins him helplessly. <laughs> Eric stops in front of the vault, eyeing the keyhole carefully. Hank! You better be right! He thrusts the key into the lock and turns it. Just then, Venger frees himself from the vice grip of the amoeba with a burst of magic. But his eyes glow wildly as he realizes he's too late. No! The massive door on the vault swings open. A cascade of light bursts forth, so brilliant it causes Eric to stagger backwards. And as the amoeba is finally about to make the gang his meal, a burst of brilliance washes over the creature. It shimmers and vanishes, dropping the exhausted kids to the floor. Venger is helpless against the wave of glistening magic which utterly engulfs him. All over the land, streams of magic burst from the tower, spreading away from the realm's edge. A field full of serfs toiling away at their crops see a magic bolt impact near them like an incandescent meteorite. A portal opens up, showing the single sun of Earth shining over a medieval town. The serfs drop their implements and rush toward the portal. Elsewhere, another magic bolt zaps a portal near a group of lizard men. The world open for them is that of a tropical jungle, with three red suns shining above it. The lizard men rush into the portal. In fact, bolts of pure magic from the cenotaph descend into all parts of the realm, creating portals wherever they strike, even the servants of Venger himself. Orcs, bollywogs, and other species of beings flee in terror as a bolt arcs toward the citadel. Shadow Demon emerges, sees the approaching destruction, and makes a hasty exit, just as the citadel is struck by the bolt and completely destroyed. Back in the sanctum of the cenotaph, Eric sits dazed before a huge empty vault. The group runs to Eric and helps him to his feet. Did you see that? You kidding? We were ringside. Looks like Hank was right. Hank! The kids rush to the edge of the abyss and look down, fearing the worst. But they smile in relief. Well, don't just stand there. Hank hangs onto the jagged rock that dangles over the abyss. <sighs> Diana extends her staff to Hank. It glows as he pulls himself up, hand over hand. He takes his place beside his friends, but something grabs their attention. Still wrapped in the luminous spell, Venger is transformed. Before the very eyes, he changes into the noble, majestic figure, whose likeness is carved on the sarcophagus. He looks down at himself in disbelief. I was right. Our mission in the realm was not to defeat Venger. It was to redeem him. Venger approaches the kids, but just then, a burst of prismatic light appears and forms into that of Dungeon Master. He looks at Venger. He is pleased. Venger kneels before him. Father, I... I have returned. Thank you, my young pupils. You have done the one thing it was not in my power to do. You have returned my son to me. You're Venger's father? There's not a big family resemblance. Thousands of years ago, I chose to follow another master, one of evil. I imprisoned in the cenotaph all that which Dungeon Master had given me. And now, you have set me free. Dungeon Master raises his hands, and one final bolt of crackling magic streaks from the vault, impacting near the kids and creating a portal. With wide eyes, they look inside and see the amusement park. <gasps> As you have given those trapped in this realm their freedom, I can do no less for you. You are free to return to your world now if you wish. Or you can stay here in the realm. There is still much evil to be dealt with and many adventures yet to be had. The choice, my children, is yours. The kids look at each other, grinning. 
tears of happiness in their eyes, ready to make their greatest decision of all. They survey their newly transformed surroundings, the realm's edge, majestic mountains, and puffy clouds. Even the incredible vista of the entire realm itself, with its myriad lands and life forms, its joys, its dangers. Though it's a new realm now, it still is, and always will be, the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons Requiem was written by Michael Reeves. Additional narrative embellishments by Wally Wingert. Voice direction by Chuck Garrick, Daniel Roebuck, Wally Wingert, and Katie Lee. Dungeons and Dragons Requiem featured the voice talents of Katie Lee as Sheila and Bobby. Wally Wingert as Hank, Uni, and Dungeon Master. Daniel Roebuck as Eric. Buster Roebuck as Presto. Laura Lee as Diana. And Neil Kaplan as Venger. Engineering by Nathan Mealy Savlowich and Chuck Garrick. Production support by Lindsay Byrne. Dungeons and Dragons Requiem was recorded before a live studio audience at Voice Tracks West in Studio City, California. This is your announcer speaking. <laughs>